Hello, and welcome to another video from Ritual Woodcraft. I actually picked this up off of Craigslist for $10. Now, supposedly it's 70 years old. It could very easily be 70 years old when I look at the hardware that was used and the grains on the wood and the plywood. And it was made out of scraps. That's the best thing. It's made out of scraps. And as far as the design, what I really like about it is a single point where you turn one knob to raise it up and down. You don't have to turn two knobs. It moves very steady. I have uneven ground here because I'm outside and it works really well. It adjusts quickly and easily and it just works. I can use it with my drill press or my radial arm saw. I only wish it went high enough that I could use it with the bandsaw, so that's a modification I will make. I drew up some plans so that I could get an idea of the wood that I would need. I made a list, planning to build this out of scraps, but you see, I build a lot of fine furniture, so my wood scraps generally consist of things like white oak, mahogany, maple, even walnut. So I'm going to look through my white oak and see if I have enough scrap to build this stand entirely out of white oak. And as it turns out, I do. I like it so much I want to use it for infeed and outfeed, so I just need more of them. And that's the pleasure of building a piece like this. It doesn't have to adhere specifically to plans for a client's piece of fine furniture, so it doesn't have to match any precise size or dimension. We can have a little fun when we build this. So I really enjoy a project like this in between all the commissions that I do because I can just relax and enjoy it. Now my plan is to shape the feet differently from the original. I like this design a little better. It looks stronger. So let's begin to dimension this wood into the approximate sizes we will need. This way we'll be certain that we have enough and and I like to label everything with a piece of blue tape as I go along just to make sure I've accounted for each piece. Again, right now the sizes don't have to be super accurate. We're just getting in the neighborhood of the dimensions that we will need. And we will fit everything as we build it. My real priority now is to just make certain that each board is square and true. So as I do fit it and cut it during the build, I don't have to worry about things being out of square. And it always pays to sand your components as you go along, especially in areas where it'll be hard to reach into the corners and joints. I do like the relative dimensions of this original piece, but I am using hardwood as opposed to the various different species used in the original that was built from scraps, obviously. And as you can see, I've laid out the shape of the feet that I prefer for this reproduction. And I'm going to cut these out on the bandsaw. Now, if you don't have a bandsaw, of course you can use a jigsaw, a handsaw, uh, any way to get the job done. I like using the bandsaw. I have a really nice blade on it. It's a carbide tipped blade and it cuts through hardwoods with ease. I can actually do some very delicate work with this three quarter inch width blade. And after I have the first of the two feet complete, I can certainly use it as a template as I make the second one. And I will sandwich the two feet together in a vise as I sand the edges smooth 
to make certain that they match relatively closely. And I'm going to use a round over bit in my trim router to soften the edges just on the outside of each foot because on the inside they're going to meet at a joint and I'm not certain that I want those edges rounded over yet. Now you can see here on the original that the builder created a lap joint where the sides meet the feet. It'll be strong whether you do a lap joint or not. I happen to have a radial arm saw set up with a dado blade that I use for cutting rabbits and dados and it's dedicated to that purpose so it's easy for me to cut out the wood for the lap joint. But again, you don't have to. Now I have glued and screwed this joint together and I'm going to use construction screws mostly as I assemble this but I'm not going to glue any other joints just yet. When I first viewed this piece in the Craigslist ad I thought this joint right here connected by these two butt fasteners was actually a dovetail joint. That's what it looked like in the tiny photograph. As I said, I'm able to do some rather delicate cuts on this bandsaw, so I'll use it for cutting my joints. But there's always more than one way to do it. You could use a coping saw, a traditional hand saw, or a back saw like this Japanese razor saw. And I think these make excellent cuts for joinery. They affect the cut on the backstroke, which gives you great control, and you can make a really straight cut with just a little practice. Now these joints, once glued and screwed, will be very strong, and it's not rocket science. They don't have to be super precise. Remember, we can have a little fun with this project. What is important with these joints, these first joints, is that they are 90 degrees and square because the mechanism that's going to slide up and down in these two side pieces will only slide easily and consistently if the shape is perfectly square. And to that end, we begin with these top joints 90 degrees and true. But there's flexibility in the bottom right now because there's nothing stretching between the two sides. And remember, we took measurements of the original, but they're just relative. We have to get the dimension right there. Perfect. So the measurements that we took originally, forget about it. And as you can see, that space at the top joints is 16 and 7 eighths plus a hair. So when I cut this stretcher, 16 and 7 eighths plus a hair. And I'm also going to have to trim this stretcher so that it'll match the space that we've cut out in both feet. And I'm going to go ahead and use my trim router to round over this edge of the stretcher. I'm not going to round over the back edge because it will join to two vertical pieces of wood. Now we're going to take note of the stays on these sides that will keep the roller mechanism sliding smoothly straight up and down. What I am going to do is extend these stays the full length of the side pieces so that I can extend the reach and the throw of my roller holder because I want to go to 48 inches so that I can use this with my band saw. So on my reproduction these stays are going to run the entire length of the side pieces and I will fit them together with the side pieces and the space in between them will tell me the dimension that I need for the width of my roller holder. Too wide and it'll stick. Too narrow and it'll be sloppy. So I'm going to wait until I have all these stays attached and then determine the width of those two pieces. And again, I'm not gluing anything further at this point because I may have to put things together and take them apart several times before I'm finished. And now that I have these stays firmly attached, running the full length of the sides, I will check the space in between them to determine how to cut the two pieces of the roller holder just a hair wider than an inch and a half. So I think an inch and a half will be the perfect dimension to cut these side sliders. 
and I'm verifying that right now to make certain that they slide easily within that space before I attach everything. Now the spreader that goes between those two side sliders is one more place where we can mess up and compromise the functionality of the sliding piece wide enough that it doesn't pull those two pieces in and we have to make it narrow enough that it doesn't push those two pieces against the sides so that it's too tight to slide easily. Once we determine that dimension and cut it very squarely we can screw those side sliders onto this stretcher. All the joints that I use screws to attach are pre-drilled and countersunk pre-drilled because I'm working very close to the ends of a lot of these boards and I want to avoid any splitting. Pre-drilling is very important. Don't overlook it. And it easily moves up and down, in and out, without too much slop. So, so far, so good. Now remember that keystone shape that I saw in the Craigslist pictures that turned out to be those two butt fasteners. I want that dovetail joint on my reproduction. And I'm going to cut it out again on the bandsaw, but you can use whatever type of saw that you have at your disposal. I can cut these on the bandsaw, but I have to be mindful of the kerf, the thickness of the saw blade. And I'm going to cut the initial shape of what will fit into the cross member first. I'll cut it as accurately as I can, but it really doesn't matter what the final shape of that is as long as I trace that exact shape onto the piece of wood that it'll mate with. And on these, I cut just outside the pencil line. And on the piece that it will mate with, I'm going to cut just inside the pencil line so that the fit will be tight and not so tight that it splits the joint and not so loose that it will wobble. You can master this with just a little practice. Hardwoods are a little more demanding than softwoods because they require tighter accuracy in a fit like this. But if you're working with plywoods or softwoods, you'll find that you can compress the fibers in wood to make something that's close fit. And these types of joints are so strong because they give you a lot more surface area for glue. But remember, we're not going to glue these up just yet. But a joint like this will fit very tight, even in the dry fit. And it'll be very strong. So whichever tool you use, be mindful of this. And take your time, move slowly and as precisely as you can. And it'll save you a lot of time in the long run, because you won't have to do these joints twice. I nibble away at these shapes slowly and carefully. Remember, I have a very large resaw blade in my bandsaw. It's three-quarter inch width. It does have about a sixteenth of an inch kerf, which I will have to work with. And it's got beautiful carbide teeth that cut through this hardwood very easily and allow me to be rather precise, even though I'm using a monster blade. You can see the width of the kerf right there in that corner. I'll have to work with that shape. Now the final result is as rough as the teeth on your blade. And you can see the saw marks right here on the edges. As far as I'm concerned, this helps the joint. It'll give a lot of places for glue to go and it'll help those edges bite onto each other. The secret in a fit that looks good is to have the outside edges clean. The inside, you don't have to worry about so much. I'd say that's pretty good. And look at the grain on this oak. I just love American white oak. It's not perfect. There's a little chip out and there's those squared off edges right where the angles meet from the wide curve of the blade. But it's going to work good and it's going to be a solid joint. 
And as we screw this all together one more time, you see why we didn't glue everything up as we went along, because I've taken this apart and put it back together a few times already. This allows us to make adjustments as we go along if we find that we need them. If not, it's okay too. And when we're all finished and everything's working as it should and looks as it should, then we can glue it all together. I actually like the industrial look that these screws give a piece. They're golden in color. They'll go beautifully with this American white oak. And this is the knob and bolt that I'm going to use to cinch the pieces of wood together. Look at the old knob on this original piece. And that's solid brass. I'm going to drill right there and use that as a point where I will start the slot. I'll probably use a router to cut that slot, but there's more than one way you can do it. And remember, I want to make my slot long enough so that the throw or reach of this sliding mechanism will give me a full 48 inch extension. So first I'm going to mark where that slot will begin by drilling a hole. I'm going to drill through this first piece of wood and then just slightly into the second piece which is the stretcher holding the sliding sides. I don't want to drill entirely through that at this point. So I'm going to carefully drill through this stretcher in the sliding mechanism now. And you can see right behind it, there is a two inch wide piece of wood that I've attached and glued to it. Now this is a Forstner bit that I'll use to make a cutout so that we can sink the head of this carriage bolt below the surface of the piece of wood where it will rest. Now we have the recess drilled and we have a round hole centered in that. We want the square part of the shaft just under the carriage bolt head to bite into that wood. So I'm going to square off that rounded hole just slightly to give it a way to start into the wood since I'm using oak and it's very hard. You can see I've just given it a place to go and I'll drive it in there to make sure that it is seated tightly. And you can always if you make this a little too sloppy, you can always add some epoxy glue. But I can tell by the sound of that, this bolt is seated. So I'm over at the router table to cut the slot, and I'm going to use the hole that I drilled through this piece as a starting point. And I've marked both ends as far as how far I want that slot to go. And I'll carefully guide this piece of wood along that router bit to cut my slot. You could actually cut a pretty effective slot like this on the table saw, placing your piece of wood against the fence and cranking up the blade to cut through it. Now I've replaced these two vertical pieces back into the roller stand where they go. I'm using two inch and a quarter screws that will enter in that vertical piece from the inside and seat in the cross members between the feet. We haven't glued this up yet, so we're able to remove pieces as needed. And I have one whole side off as far as that center vertical piece and the cross member between the feet is concerned. And I can add this sliding mechanism now, reseat the bolt, and then put it all together. Checking once again now to make sure everything still slides easily without slop, just the way that it should. Okay, let's install the knob and try it out. I want it to bite easily and securely without having to turn the knob a great deal. Remember, a lot of times you'll be doing this with one hand, and it works well. Now as far as the roller, there's a lot of things you could use. I suppose you could use an old rolling pin, uh, especially if it had ball bearings. That would be really nice. This tends to squeak a lot, 
it's just steel rod. I guess it's drilled and glued into a hardwood wool. This is probably some kind of maple. I've actually grown accustomed to the squeaking and I kind of like it. I'll probably do something a little different. I think I'm going to use maple. So I've glued two pieces of hard maple together and I have a two inch square. I've cut it to fit my space and I'm going to take it to the lathe and, and round it off. If you don't have a lathe, you still have options. You could use handrail, you could use uh, a dowel of uh, I guess the largest size you could find, anything close to two inch, but I believe you'd be okay anything over an inch. Or you could cut and trim it on the table saw, one corner at a time, a little bit more, a little bit more until it was round, and then use some sandpaper. Remember, this is never going to be high speed action, so things don't have to be perfect. But we'll go to the lathe and see what we could do with this hard maple. Now, as far as this lathe is concerned, working with a wood lathe is very new to me. This is something I just picked up recently. Uh, a man had it in his garage. It was his brother's. His brother bought it years ago, used it a couple times, really didn't like it much, and it's just been sitting in this garage. It's an old tool that is relatively new as far as use goes, and I was able to pick it up for $50. Just like any other tool that uses chisels on wood, it's all about the quality and integrity of your chisel and the edge that you give that chisel. So you'll probably spend or invest a lot more into the tools that you'll use with this lathe than you might on the lathe. This is a very basic lathe. It is adjustable as far as its speed, its RPMs, but to adjust it, you have to open it up and change the belt from one pulley to another. It doesn't have a, a dial where you can electronically adjust the speed of the motor. And it's not as convenient as some of the newer lathes that have a lot of adjustment knobs. Uh, if you want to move things around here, you need a wrench. But hey, it's my first lathe. It's, it can spin a 40-inch spindle, and it works as I'm learning. I'm finding, and as I work with this lathe, I'm finding that it's, again, all about the integrity and sharpness of your chisels. And it's also about finesse, not strength. You ease the cutting edge into the wood, and you find the angle that doesn't only make a bunch of fine particles and sawdust. You want to see chips and preferably nice smooth thin shavings coming off the wood that you're turning. Shavings like you might see from a plane. Again, a plane is a fine chisel edge held in a tool at a particular angle to give you those fine shavings. And as you're working with the lathe and the chisel, you find that angle with your hands and you finesse it into the wood. Now cutting a very symmetrical roller may be more difficult than other shapes you can think of because it has to be level and smooth across the entire width. Now this is just a roller stand to feed wood and it's not going to be a high speed roller so little imperfections won't show. You may not like sanding but at least for the first few times when you use a lathe to sand a spindle you're going to enjoy it. It's effortless and painless and depending on the grit of the sandpaper that you use that abrasive can be a very effective carving tool and you can remove a lot of wood quickly. And at the end I'll use a flat surfaced sanding pad to help me get a straight edge across the width of this roller.
Now with a piece of wood for backing, I'm going to drill a hole that is the little bit larger than the diameter of this top part of the bolt so that it can roll freely. It's exactly 7 eighths of an inch down from the top and centered in this one and a half inch wide piece of wood. This bolt will turn freely in there. I am going to pre-drill each end of this roller with a bit that is the dimension or the width uh, the diameter of that bolt minus the threads so that I'll be able to screw it in from either side. The threads will bite into the roller and hold it, but I won't worry about splitting the roller. Okay. Theoretically, this should screw right in. And we should be able to center it and let it roll. Let's see how that works. I'm going to like that. As far as a finish for this piece, I've used a little Danish oil. I've given it one coat, and I'll probably maintain that finish periodically by wiping down with other oils, probably just linseed oil uh, mixed with a little mineral spirits, just to keep it protected. But I don't want this wood to darken to any extent that it loses the beauty and luminescence it has right now. Just look at this American white oak. I think it is such a beautiful species to work with. I'm really happy that I had enough of it to build this piece. I think it's absolutely beautiful. And it's just a tool for around the shop. But I'll take pleasure in using it every time. And I'll remember how enjoyable it was to make this build. And while I modeled this off the original, I also modified it for the dimensions that suited me. And that's the beauty of this type of construction. You can do what you want. This is a general guide. I find it very useful. I'm tired of the rolling stands that you get from the big box store. They're made out of metal. You think these are great. You get them home, you use them for a little while, and the plastic handle that tightens it down breaks. There's always that one plastic piece that is the weak link that is part of the designed obsolescence of everything you seem to buy today. That original piece is 70 years old, made from scraps. Who knows how long this one made out of American white oak will last. I know it will outlast me. What's not to like? I hope that you've enjoyed this video and the build. If you like what you've seen, please subscribe and consider ringing the bell. That way you'll be updated when I post new videos.